There we go, Kev. So we're just waiting for a few people to come. Indeed. Hopefully. Welcome to our nightmare. Welcome to our nightmare, yeah. <laughs> Kev's been here for about 17 days waiting for this. Yeah, feels like it. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully, folks, you can hear us. If you can hear us, then just give us a thumbs up. That'll be good. I think. Can, well, any, can you see that? Okay. Two, yeah. okay. Let's have a look. Fantastic. Great. And you can hear us okay. Just give us a thumbs up. Brilliant. That's good. So we're just going to give everyone a couple of minutes. Just to settle in. In fact, what we could do, Kev, is a little meditation. How about a little meditation for a couple of minutes just to settle everyone in? So if anyone else comes, they can just join us in a, in a second. So, if you're there, just maybe close your eyes. Just steady your breath down. So anything you've been doing this morning and yesterday and last week, put that all to one side. And anything you've got to do later on, today, tomorrow, again, we'll just put that to one side. And wherever you are, just settling in, just slowing your breathing down, relaxing. And any sounds, thoughts come to your mind, just leave them, just watch your thoughts. Just settling in. Just to link with us tonight. Me and Kev. Kev's going to share some insights and stories. And I hope that it inspires you, resonates with you. open our eyes. How's everybody doing? It's a beautiful day. We've just been for a walk down the lake and we get a bit of fresh air, wake ourselves up a little bit. So I wanted to introduce you to Kev. And um, Kev describes himself, well, in, what his therapy is, as kind of weird and wonderful. And we're going to come on to a little bit about, well, in fact, we'll start there. If you were to kind of summarise what you do as a therapist, okay. and that, that kind of weird and wonderful thing, the labels attached to them, what would they be? What would you describe yourself as? Well, I have various tools in my toolbox. One is kinesiology, which is more about the physical side of fixing people, although it works on Chinese medical principles and meridian lines and stuff like that. I do... Crystal healing, which is again a little bit more physical, although we're starting to get a bit woo-woo. Um, spiritual healing, Reiki, whatever you want to call it, it's all the same energies, although I don't use symbols. And shamanic healing, so I was taught shamanic healing traditionally, and I can still do the traditional stuff, but I tend to do it more in a modern way and take the clients through the journeys to get their power back to release their emotions, to forgive, to cut cords, to talk to people about if they're still in a relationship with people, things going forwards. Um, and then there are other things that I do that I'm not even aware of. <laughs> so I had, a, I had a, a session with Kev the other day, and to be honest with you, he's very, very unique, to be honest with you. And so we're going to come more into the therapies maybe a bit later on. But I've just kind of wanted to, first of all, introduce Kev. Because he came to us probably about two years ago, 18 months, two years ago. Yes. And then we had lockdown. And then everything went a little bit pear-shaped. And then one thing after then you became ill and now you're back. Yes. So I kind of want to go back with you where it all began for you. A little bit about your, your story, if you like. Because you said that, you know, I, think you, I don't know if you lived in South Africa, but you were bullied in school. I was oh. bullied in school in the UK okay. when I was a child <clears throat> and then we went emigrated to South Africa with my parents and I got bullied there by a guy that 
from Middlesbrough that lived in our block of flats. Um, I have, did, however, enjoy South Africa. It's one big adventure. How old were you then when you kind of went? I was there uh, from about 10 until 12. So, so you lived in the UK until about 10? Yes. And you went to South Africa about, and that must have been a quite cultural shock, really. Or was you to and fro before? Well, when you're 10 years old, you just think it's one big adventure. But I, I do remember so. when we landed in South Africa, <laughs> yeah. we, you have to go to Joburg and then get a smaller plane or whatever to go on to wherever afterwards. And I remember coming down the airplane steps and just collapsing in the heat and <laughs> smacking my nose in the red dirt and I was out of it for two days. Really? Because of the heat? Yeah. Because you yeah. never experienced anything yeah, like and it. And also because you've been on a really cold airplane with all the yeah. air conditioning and stuff. Yeah, and I was out of it for two days. So your dad went over there and mum went to emigrate to work. What was that about then? Yeah, well, he decided it was either going to be South Africa or Australia. However, he knew some friends from his, that had set up an engineering company in Durban. So that was the idea. They were saying they'd give him a job if he went over. So he picked South Africa. Um, he got the job. Um, but unfortunately, at the time, it was still the apartheid years and there was loads of violence going on. So, and did you witness that then? Uh, personally, no, um, but we did hear that some of my parents' friends had been attacked in the street and stuff like that. So, so did that influence you, that kind of era of your life then? It did a lot because <laughs> I learned to sail then. I used to go down to the local harbour, the local yacht club, and help them launch their boats in the morning. And then when I came back in for lunch and went out in the afternoon, some of them used to say, well, get on, we'll teach you how to sail. And I used to love that. But we used to finish school, I think it was about two o'clock in the afternoon. And there was just a road between me, well, my school and the beach. So it was sod the homework on the beach, <laughs> go swimming. So you loved it, it was like a big on before you? Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, but you were aware of the violence and the apartheid at that time, I guess, really? Well, then. Or not? Yeah. My parents were, but I didn't really see much of it. And and as a kid, because you haven't been programmed to be racist or anything, <laughs> I used to talk to quite a lot of the uh, the various um, people there. There's a robin out there looking at us. <laughs> Spirit of wants to join us. Yeah. So there was one old guy. He was an old Zulu guy in our block of flats. He was the uh, the warden, if you like. And I used to sit with him for hours and he used to teach me Zulu and stuff like that. And the, the language? Yeah. Wow. Well, that was quite hard because it's all the bits and okay. stuff like that. But then It doesn't quite fit right because it's a Zulu in a block of flats. No. It doesn't no, quite resonate quite well, does no. it really? But then his counterpart, he was a big Bantu guy, he was miserable, so we used to wind him up on a number of occasions. Okay. So. so you were bullied out there as well as a kid? Yes. And then you said you'd come back, you know, with your mum and dad. Yeah. And then you went, you become the school nutter. Well, on the way back, we had quite a holiday because my dad decided that by the time we got back to England, we wouldn't have been able to afford holidays. So we came back by boat, which took us two weeks. So I saw quite a bit of South Africa. So we done, we obviously left from Durban, we done Port Elizabeth, East London, Cape Town, and then we stopped at Madeira mm -hmm. and then into Southampton. So I saw a lot of animals and stuff like that. There was an old guy on the boat who was into his photography. And we would have a coach trip out to one of the game reserves. And I used to follow him and we used to walk miles. Did you? Taking photographs of animals and things like yeah. that. So much so that they used yeah. to get really upset because the coach was late getting back to the ship. Do so you think that's where your connection to the earthy type of environment came from? Do you think it was born there, really? I, it was born there because I used to live in Hatfield and there was a local woods near us called Spring Woods. And I was always down there and making dams and things like that. And my mother, God rest her soul, <coughs> I came home about five or six times on the trot with my wellies full of water. And on the sixth time, luckily for me, it was about the same time as my dad came home. She picked me up on one hand off the floor and she had me against the wall and she was slowly throttling me because I'd pushed her over the edge. Really? Yeah, and then the, the old man come through the door and prized me out her hands off of me. And so you, you had quite a lot of violence in the family as well? Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably the only time mothers 
really lost it like that. But yeah. <clears throat> my mother did have some mental health issues that she was always shouting at you because she was a bit OCD and if you went out and moved one of her ornaments in millimetres, she'd know about it. So you were living in fight and flight quite a lot of the time, didn't realise it. Indeed. Maybe. So I used to go out, especially when we came back and went to Plymouth, I used to go out at nine o'clock in the morning. I used to whistle, they used to call me the Pipe Piper and Liam. About 20 <laughs> dogs would come and I'd take them all over Devonshire countryside wow. and come back at six, seven o'clock at night. Right? But you said like that you were kind of, you turned into like the nut out or the bully. Yeah. Because it was a defence mechanism. Yes, so when my <clears throat> dad decided when we came back, instead of going back up to Hertfordshire, he would enrol me in a ball boys school in Plymouth. We wanted to live in Plymouth. And so I thought, I'm not going to become a bully or a victim of bullying here. So like you say, I became the school nutter. So it wasn't so much fighting, because um, I wasn't much of a fighter. Um, however, they used to stupidly teach us how to make chlorine gas in the chemistry lab. So I used to go in and open, open a fume covered door on a Friday afternoon, because I'd had a collection with the lads, go and open all the doors in the school and fill the school full of chlorine gas so we had to go in. So not to in the respect of you just kind of mischievous to a, a, yes. a large extent. Yes. Or I'd go and pour potassium down the sink <laughs> <and> <laughs> <have another laughs> cut, which yeah. catches fire when it hits water and you can hear it going through the pipes. So they have to call So you were the class clown as well as anything yes. else. So they had to call Did you think fire you fitted really, yeah. then? Because normally like that type of character do that because they don't fit. I I'm an Aquarian so I don't fit anyway, um, um, but also I knew a lot of people and I'm, I'm fairly able to get on with people, but there weren't very many people that I would have called close friends. Mm. So I know, even now I know loads and loads of people, mm. but there are not many that are close friends. You got a lot of acquaintances. Yes. Yeah. And is that something for you then, do you think? That you don't let people in, or you don't trust people, or, or what do you think it's, that is? It's a bit of both, but it's definitely the Aquarian traits that we're we're sociable, but we also want to be loners. Mm. And we're quite happy sitting in the middle of nowhere, all on my top, and doing whatever, listening to things. So when I was doing that as a kid, I've seen a stoke catch a rabbit, and when it caught the rabbit, the rabbit screamed, and I thought it was a girl getting raped. And then when I went round, I could see the stoke in the rabbit off so your average person probably wouldn't see that in a yeah. lifetime but so you because I'm stalking about solitude the woods. Really, like, in yeah. your own way. Yes. So you said then your dad was a military copper. Well and, and he kicked you out of the house at sixteen. Well he used to keep being called down to school and the punishments got worse and I rebelled more because Aquarius rebel against authority so Rebelled against your dad or the school? Yeah, or both? yeah all, all of it. Um, but the punishments for my dad got worse and worse and worse until one day we sort of, he was hitting me in the stomach and dropping me and picking me back up and hitting me again. And I think it was for something I hadn't done because anyway, I, I lost it and I turned around and I hit him. And we both kind of went, wow, I'm now bigger than he thinks I am and I'm also able to knock him. He's not as hard as he thinks he is either. So. Um, so we split, he told me it's about time I left home and I was 16 and a half. So you, would, you, did you finish school then as well after that? Yeah, time? I finished school. I tried to join the army in Plymouth but got um, offered the infantry and I told them no. So I moved back up to my grand's in Hertfordshire. She had mental health issues as well. She was a schizophrenic. The company I was working for, I'd met a Sikh guy and we got on great. So you were only about 16 now? Yeah, well, I was probably coming up towards 17 by then. Um, he said to me, well, why don't I go and move in with him and his family? So I did. Then his mother got was struggling a little bit with her age, so I went and moved in with his sister and her husband. What was that like then? So it sounds like you had a lot of cultural experiences. So you were here in the UK. Yes. You went to South Africa, you, you know, you met a Zulu in a flat, yep. and you kind of had that experience of kind of, you know, being out in nature and the sea, come back, and then you got into a different, almost a dip by accident, like really, because you were forced out, yep. into a different culture, yep. into a Sikh community. Yeah, and I loved it. Yeah? Yeah. Did it resonate with you, that kind of, was it the family unit, what kind of, what, did, what felt different to you? 
I don't know about the resonating bit. It was just curiosity and interest that living with somebody different. Uh, yeah. Aquarians like to be challenged all the time, and then to go into like a totally different environment and learn how other people live and what their values and that are. It, it was absolutely brilliant. But it got to the point where I thought, I really need to go somewhere on my own. I need to get a trade. So I applied to join the army again, and I joined as a vehicle mechanic. So the army got me all around the world. So I've been Canada, most places in Europe. I was sailing the Baltic Ocean. In fact, my first year, two years in the army, so how old I spent most at? of it at sea. Wow. How old were you when you joined the army? 17 and a half. So you were a young kid, weren't you? Yeah. Did you see? Did you go back and see your parents then at all, or no contact with them? Well, initially I didn't want to have any contact with them, but on my pass out parade, the lady or the young girl I was going out with at the time, somehow or other, had found my parents' address. So you didn't even know where they were? No, and <laughs> she sent wow. them the invite, and so the next minute I'm standing on parade, doing all the TikTok bit. And then I looked and I thought, what are those twats doing here? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, when we marched off, you're supposed to go into the cookhouse and sit with your parents and have a meal and all the rest of it. Well, they were one end of the cookhouse and I was up the other with a girlfriend. And I wouldn't go and sit with them. So in the end, my old man collared my commanding officer and explained what was going on. And my commanding officer ordered me to go and sit with my parents. And so really, in a way, when you think about it, they were, I guess, do you think they were trying to reach back for you? Yeah. Or was there another motive? Or? Yes, I think they were, and I think they were probably quite proud that instead of going to jail, which was the way I was going, because in Plymouth I rebelled that much, I was hanging around with the old angels and all sorts, that I'd actually started to make something of myself, and I'd got a trade, and, and the army was my and boss. That's a really interesting years. point, though, isn't it? Because the... In that, like, so you, from what I can listen to, like, you kind of, you know, you, if your mum's pinning you up against the wall and your dad's battering you really yeah. to a degree, and you kind of rebelled and you got this anger because you said, and we'll go on to that in a minute, that you had a, at some point you had a choice and like you went into, you were fueled by the anger, yes, you know, to go into a different avenue. So there was a fork in the road, wasn't yes. that? I Do think you remember when that was? Rebelliousness rather than anger. I didn't. If I was angry, I didn't really know it at the time. Yeah. However, somebody had done my astrological chart and they said I was on a knife edge. I could have gone either way. So they did that when you were about 17? Yeah. So mm -hmm. luckily, I was going the wrong way and then the army brought me back, back to the light. So it gives you the, the discipline, maybe, or, yes. or routine or something. Well, it gave me that, and it was also, every day was different in the army, because, you know, one minute you'd be in Canada, and then Kenya, and the Falklands, and wherever, so there was lots of variety like that. One minute you'd be working in a workshop in Germany, and the next minute you were out in the boondocks, because the Russians were supposed to be coming. And one of the things in Germany, at the time, because it was the Cold War, they said your life expectancy, if the Russians did come, was four days. Four days. So all we were there to do was to slow them down until the, they got to like Frankfurt and then the Yanks would sort them out because there was no real Americans on the front line. So yeah. again, you were faced like almost like with that threat of, yes. you know, fear so on some level. I lived life to the full. Life, didn't you? Yeah, I lived life to the full. I was, I was an alcoholic, but I was out drinking as a young lad. I was smoking my brains out because it was all duty free over there. Yeah. So you had a good time in your eyes. Yeah, but even in Germany, I used to get in with the locals and meet the locals and have friends with the locals because they used to tell you where to go and the take your places and things like that. Whereas a lot of uh, the British Army go over there and, oh, you bombed our chippy, you know? And it's not about that, you know? It's about wherever I've gone, even when I went to Kenya, I got in with the locals and they decided to take us off. The four days R and R and show us Lake Nabasha and Nakuru and places like that that mm -hmm. I wouldn't have seen otherwise. So you got a great, great experience really, travel wise, then yes. and people wise, and then yes. you kind of you said like you you made peace with your dad. He yes. passed, and then he passed away. Yeah. Well, eventually, over a period of time, I got out of the army. I moved back 
to where my parents were living in Hertfordshire, we started talking and repairing the relationship and then I got promoted and moved up to the Midlands um, and then ended up getting a pub. But in the meantime, you ended up getting a pub. Yeah, in the meantime. Were you married or anything like that? Or kind of? Yeah, I got married in the army. I was only about 22, something like that. Was she in the army? Or? No, no, she was. Um, I bought her back as a souvenir from my first Northern Ireland tour. Okay, right. Okay. <laughs> I should have left the letter <laughs> born on the shelf, but right. I decided to bring her home. And you um, got married? Yeah. You started the pub? Well, we got married first. Um, Jackie spent most of my army career following me about and living the army sort of wife life. Um, and then we got out, we went back to Hertfordshire. I was selling packaging and stuff at the time. Then we moved to the Midlands, Jackie came with me, and then we had the pub for five years. But part of my starting of the spiritual stuff was not long after I left the army, I was so unfit it was unbelievable, so I thought I'd better do something about it, so I took up martial arts. And after about six months of the kids taking the mickey out of, oh look my dad's in his pyjamas again, <laughs> they joined, and we all three of us managed to get to black belt second degree, and I was teaching it, so... How long were you teaching that for you? Well, one of the reasons I wanted to get into teaching was AOs. I've always been good at teaching because they teach you in the army how to teach. Yeah. Um, but my marriage wasn't doing very well at the time and so my wife became an art, martial arts widow because wherever there was a school that their chief instructor was on holiday or something like that, I used to go and take the school for them. Um, on a Sunday we had a chief instructor's class but I used to get there early help him teach his kids and then his adults classes and then do our chief instructors. But then I used to drive all the way from Ealing in London to Luton to go and do Thai boxing and stick fighting. And then I'd get home about 10 o'clock at night. Sounds like you were channeling a lot of kind of energy really. Yes. Do you think it was pent up anger from... I don't think so because it was probably a boost for my self-confidence yeah. because then you, you walk different and you hold yourself different and the people on the street look at you and go, oh, don't want to mess with him. And then also, because you've been in the army and you do bodybuilding and stuff mm -hmm. like that and running around with stupid amounts of weight on your back. I guess it gives you, you an identity and some confidence through the yeah. you know, so How yes. long were you teaching that for? So I probably ended up teaching for about five or six years down south. And then when we moved up, I opened a school in my village wasn't very successful there wasn't many people coming to it um, but at the time as well I'd also bought the pub so I needed to spend more time working than skiving over the road <laughs> um, but the thing is while I had the pub my dad had died and that was at the point where we just got the relationship good and it was a surprise because we thought there was nothing wrong with him but he went to Plymouth to see my sister and he kept complaining that he had a bad back and then he kept passing out of the pain and after about the third attempt at getting into hospital he was told to, not to tell him nothing because he kept saying oh it's, it, I've got a bad back and they kept saying oh it's the pain then and then when he actually done a blood test he had septicemia because wow. his heart valves were dodgy but it was too late and he was on life support for probably about six weeks eight weeks and then how long were you then? I think I was probably about 40, 45. So yeah. again, yeah, but we had to make the decision to turn the machine off. Wow. Which really wound me up because my sisters are watching my dad, but I'm watching the heart monitor and I could see it. And I sort of nudged the nurse and said, is this it? And she said, yeah. I couldn't tell that to my mother and sisters. Mm. How did that affect you? That made me really, really angry. And then running a pub and trying to keep the village idiots out and the Pavia and those brigaders winding me up as well. So I knew that I had to do something about it. And because of the martial arts, I kind of dabbled with meditation a bit. Anyway, I don't read book reviews. 
Morgan in the papers, and I read this book with you, and it was Lorna Burns, Angels in Your Ears. So I certainly wouldn't have read <laughs> a review about angels. Anyway, I said to my wife at the time, she was going to get me that book. So she thought I'd fallen down the stairs and banged me out a few times. <laughs> anyway, she did, she got me the book, brought it back, I read it, and it had quite a profound effect on me, and parts of it made me really emotional about what Lorna Byrne had been through in her life. I'm going to slow you down there as you think, because I don't want to skip that, because that's quite important. Okay. So they say when you know when the student's ready, the teacher appears. Yes. And it doesn't necessarily mean like in a person it can be an no. event or even a book. Yeah. So this person, this book, yes, fell in your hands and yeah. a profound effect on you, made you emotional. What else did it do for you then? What what did it that? Well, that triggered change. me with a lot of the things that she was saying in the book. And up to this point, I didn't believe in anything spiritual. You want to talk about angels and energies and things like that, and I'd say, well, I'm a poppycock, prove yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, reading that book, and then I had a conversation with one of my customers in the pub, and I said, told her about the book, and your old man dying and stuff, and, and she says, okay, I know a guy that can come and sort you out. So She said what? I know a guy that will come and sort you out. Okay. So there was a medium called Shane Darby came down from Mansfield to where I was living near Long Eaton. And there was him, the pub was shut, but there was me, him, and my dead dad sat in the back room of the pub. And we were all bawling our eyes out because of the messages that he was giving me from my dad and he could feel his emotions. Wow. And then obviously he could see mine because I was bawling my eyes out. And he so to that him, point, so you, you never... Nothing until then. Wow. Yeah. Well, that would do, would do the, it. Obviously, the things he was telling me, I knew it was my dad because of the stuff that he would never know because he'd never yeah. met me before. So, yeah. you know, and so I was going to go to Mansfield for meditation classes, <laughs> but it was too far to leave the pub. So then I had another conversation with another client in the pub. He says, oh, my mate goes down the road. So anyway, I found this place and I went and a lady called Sally Watford. And after about the third or the fourth meditation class, I started to see things and feel things. And I go, <laughs> there is more to life than you think. Life I was seeing colours. I was feeling energies over my body and stuff like that. And I was one of these as well. My hearing's been affected, um, obviously because there's lots of loud bangs in the army. So sometimes Sally used to speak very, very quietly. So I couldn't hear her. So I would go off on my own. I would just blank out. And sometimes I never knew where I was going. Uh, but as soon as she called us back in the room, I was back. And a bit later on, there was a friend of mine who learned hypnotherapy and she was trying to um, boost her confidence in doing it. So she took me under in hypnotherapy and said, go to that place you go to when you black out. And apparently I'm a speck of dust on the edge of the black hole and I'm listening to all the information that's getting sucked into the hole. So this is what, what happened is. in your meditation. You yeah, felt when I just like, I could empty my head wow. and just go, and I didn't know I'd gone, but I'd be on the edge of this black hole listening to all this stuff getting sucked in. Wow! Like what? what well, did I didn't you know hear? what it was. Yeah. I was just listening there, you know, yeah. and twitching at the black hole, listening to it. A veil. Yeah. So that stillness is a veil yes. from which spirit comes through. Yes. And that's where you were. Yes. That's amazing. Yeah. So what an eye opener that was, really, to go from like the passing of your father and kind of, you know, angry, I guess, really, and yeah. in search of, I guess, meaning. Yes. And then one synchronicity after another after another led you to that point yes. there where you kind of taken in all this information. And what did your wife say at the time when you kind well, of came back? She just thought I was absolutely gone out. Nuts. nuts. Until you lost the phone. They all think, my whole family think that, on the male uncle okay. and my kids, although I got my daughter the other day, which we'll talk about in a yeah. minute. But uh, yeah, so, and this lady doing hypnotherapy, I mean, she done lots of past life regression on me. Um, so I know I've had lives in Atlantis and biblical times and stuff like that. So the first one, do you remember mm. the first past life regression you had? Do you, what did it, do you, because I, I had one 
with my uh, my wife as uh, yeah. she was doing case studies, and part of me was thinking, am I making this up? And then another part of it was so profound, and I came out the back of that thinking, well, it changed one particular relationship forever, and I would never have believed that before having it. Yes. So do you remember the effect that those past life regressions had on you? As a skeptic, some of them I did. Degree. Yeah, some of them I did, especially the biblical one, and then. Um, the Atlantis one, but there were lots of others, and it would seem I've had lots of lives where I've been in a position of leadership, so I've been a, a boat captain sailing people to America and got shipwrecked, and so I took on the responsibility of leading the crew and all the rest of it. I've even been a knuckle dragger. What's that? A caveman. <laughs> okay. Where I'd put sentries out to the clan, but they'd fallen asleep and then we got attacked. We were killed and then the women were dragged off to. So, do you believe in past life now? Yes. 100%. Yes. Yes. So, bring I've had so that. many different past life regressions now that there's no way that yeah. I cannot believe. But what a change that was because it, it wasn't really subtle. But before you know it, you're kind of yeah. taking in all of this energy. And not kind of quite understand what it was because you couldn't interpret it. I think that's the Aquarian thing with me as well, though, is that if I get into something like martial arts, I give it my all. As I said to you earlier, I'm addicted to books, so I read that many books, it's unbelievable. But then getting into the spiritual stuff, once I realised that it was woo woo, then I was devoted to it. And now, within reason, as long as it's coming from unconditional love, I will do whatever spirit wants me to do. So there's a big gap there, so I'm going to come on to that. Yeah, like okay. from where you were, you're kind of, you know, you're just taking in all this information, and I guess part of you would have been trying to fathom it out. What is it? What's it about? Where am I? Yes. All those kind of questions. And then you went from the pub, was it to, you studied, you went into the health kind of field where you studied kinesiology. Well, so while I was still in the pub, I'd started to struggle, study, I've done a year's spiritual healing with Sally. I've done two years crystal healing and three years kinesiology. I was also going to the Corinthian church to get more hands-on experience of healing there for about a year, two years. Um, I'd left the pub and I was working at Rolls-Royce and my boss was brilliant because we were supposed to start at nine on an evening shift and he used to let me sneak in at 10 so I could complete my courses. Um, so that was magic. So what kind of man goes into that? I mean, what man comes out of that experience? So if you imagine like you're talking maybe six, seven years of training, all the different modalities, kinesiology, crystal healing, spiritual healing, what kind of man enters that, you, and what man came out at the end? What was the difference between you and before? I and think that? I entered it, and forgive the term, as a muggle, the curiosity got the better of me, and now I haven't come out of it yet because I'm still learning. And the more I do it, the more things are being opened up for me and stuff presented and opportunities and things like that. So, so though you finish the courses, the learning never stops. No, because also as well, I still knew I had issues with my dad. So I was talking to a group of youngsters who had met my shamanic teacher, Jimmy Rogers. So you did shamanic healing as well, along, along that time as well? Well, after I'd done all that lot, um, I went to see Jimmy Rogers. She picked up on my heart issue, and it felt like she had a 12-inch red-hot knitting needle, and she was shoving it through my chest for about five minutes. It was absolute pig and agony. And then it went, and then she'd done three soul retrievals on me, one, my dad had, I'm oh, sorry, one to the girl that had invited my parents to the Passover parade. She did that with good intention. Well, I didn't even realise that I'd, yeah, um, lost a soul part to her, but because of my immaturity, I'd stuck the relationship up. And then my dad had a part of my soul, and I had a part of his, and we had to swap it. And then she said there was a part swimming out to sea at the time, and that was my relationship with my wife breaking up. So anyway, <clears throat> I'd also asked, I wanted to break the chain, because my granddad and dad were both in knack marriages, 
they were both doing rubbish jobs, but they had to keep going because they were coming close to retirement. And then they thought they were going to enjoy life. Mm. Within two years of retiring, both of them had died of heart issues. So, although Rolls Royce wasn't a naff job, I just felt a bit bored there and stuck. My marriage was coming to an end. So, she made me journey to all of her cashing records. And then while I was there, I met this guy who looked like Jesus, you know, all the rings and the beard and all that. Obviously, he wasn't Jesus. And he had a bit of parchment. And he changed it. And I signed it, he signed it, and I gave him a pearl up there. And then I came back to reality. So once I was here, the agreement was I would go and give a pearl in reality. So I went down to the local river where there's a bridge over it, did a little bit of a ceremony, thanked them, threw the pearl in the river, and got back in my car to drive home. And the next minute, pushed right back in my car seat. And I went, what the? And then I realised, because I can't get subtle messages, they're telling me that I fulfilled my part of the contract. So I had the You could actually issue. feel it. Yeah, yeah, it's pushed me right back in the seat. And so I've had my heart issue, I had the bypass, but I didn't die from it. So I broke the chain, mm. you know? So I'm, obviously you know about how I've had the pneumonia and that yeah. recently as well due to- But our, that's quite a profound thing really to go up. So you went through all this, it sounds to me like when you, when you talk about it, all roads led to that moment, that kind of, almost like that shamanic kind of, you know, when you went up and did the Akashic records, yes. all moments were leading you to that. Yes. To break that kind of karmic path. Yes. And so then do you think then that each of us have a karmic path and that can be changed or do you think it's written? Okay, so I firmly believe that we have a soul contract and that when we're sat upstairs with our guides and guardian angels and whoever else, we agree that we want to learn and experience certain things. So we write our story, we star in a film, and we get the t-shirt. Why do you believe that? Because of everything that I've seen so far, and under hip, other things in hypnosis, I've, I've kind of led, been led to understand. Yeah. Mediums have told me certain things that I can then, yeah, okay, yeah, I can, see, yeah. I can see that. So. I never wanted to retaliate when I was bullied because I don't like hurting people. So that was a heat of it that I never realised was there. Yeah. And the empath. Yeah. And so what they've done is they've guided me, or I've guided me, whatever, to join the army to take up martial arts and so on and so forth. So it's raised my self-confidence <laughs> and it's made me less fearful of a lot of issues that otherwise may have upset me. Yeah. But I think, in a way, it's the path that I've agreed to go on to lead me to become, without sounding egotistic, a spiritual warrior. Yeah. And so now there are things... So let's go back to Jeannie. So I was then starting to do see clients part-time while I was at Rolls-Royce. And then I would have some that I would be finding it difficult to heal. So I really start inviting Jeannie up to do these clients, give her healing days. She would invite me in sometimes to help her. And then I did her course and so she was inviting me in all the time. And some of the weird things that we've done to help these clients is absolutely amazing. So that was like my apprenticeship into mm. shamanic healing. Is she still alive? She is, she's still alive, she's still practicing. You still talk to yeah, her? She's just moved from Banbury to um, the Forest of Doom. So she sounds like she had a big influence on your life. Yes, very big influence. Yeah. And she even opened me up even further. Yeah. And so uh, when it got to the point that my wife and I split, I realised then that that freed me. So I, they were doing redundancies at Rolls Royce. So I didn't get a lot. I'd only been there five years, but it was enough to get me through the first year. And then we sold the house, which got me a bit more equity to get me through the second year. And I've devoted myself so far to what I'm doing, the healing and stuff. Mm. So I'm you're in line with that. And it feels like that. It feels like you are in line with it. This Maybe. is my calling. Yeah, it yeah. really is. Yeah, for the first time ever. Because there are no constraints, really. I don't feel those chains around you. As mm. I sit next to you, I don't feel them anymore. You know, those kind of ones that have been broken by you and some not by you. Yes. But you're clear. 
Yeah. Well, I was always told as well that I was in the relationship with my wife because she was there to keep my vibration low until I'd learned enough and discovered enough to be able to handle what do you want to call it, the power or the energy that spirit yeah. was going to give me, yeah. and I was mature enough and it wouldn't corrupt me. Yeah. So all the things that kept you on the path, didn't they? Yes. Like the karate and all these different things, they kept you on the path without giving you the path. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Until that well, veil come. Unbeknown to me, yeah, I was on the path, but yeah. unknowingly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now I understand that. Mm. And then what? So, I've now gone, f I went full time, that was probably what, seven, six, seven years ago, doing this. It was great until COVID because I was all over the place because I wasn't attached, I didn't have a partner or whatever, so I was in Manchester, Birmingham, the Lake District, wherever. It's like a nomad. One of the healing, I mean, I was, we were even living. My wife and I, well, once we decided to split, still in, living in the house together for six months, and she was bringing all the outlaws over from Belfast, and I thought, I don't want to be here when they get here. So Bikers? No, um, the outlaws, the indoors. Okay, okay. Yeah. Right, right. So um, I decided I'll put on Facebook that if you put me up for a night and feed me, I'll do a healing on you. So that's how you went? Yes, yeah, so I like went. Like a nomad healer? Yeah, I went to Chesterfield, <laughs> and then all the way down to Bournemouth, yeah. and then Dorchester. And what a learning curve that must have yeah, been. Yeah, um, Glastonbury, Ellesmere, and then back home again. Just doing the healing, wherever people would put you yeah, up. Yeah, that's it. And then there was another time she was doing it and bringing her family over, and I put it on again, and then there was a lady called Judy Paul, who's a medium and a hypnotherapist in Plymouth. She invited me down and I said to her, are you sure? You don't know who's mad or I could be a mad axe murderer. And she said, no, I've already checked you out upstairs. Yeah, Come on down. So I got to meet the daughter and everything. Yeah, yeah. daughter's 18th birthday party and yeah, it was great. Yeah, so you've enjoyed that travelling part, almost like yeah. a gypsy to a degree. Yeah. Well, at one point when I left the wife, I thought I wanted to be owned by a bus or something similar and just travel the country until either I found someone I really liked or someone that was an excuse to stay in a place yeah. with. Yeah. But it never happened. And then I ended up moving into the house. And the way I was gifted, the house was unbelievable as well. So I got, we had a nice 1970s three double bedroom house, nothing yeah. wrong with it, detached. Yeah. And it wasn't selling. Been on the market about 18 months, two years, hardly any viewings. And then I went to a show and I was talking to a medium and she said, yeah, you need to go back and talk to the spirits of the house. And I went, yeah, really? <laughs> so anyway, I went home and I said, wait, look, you guys, I've got to go. In three years' time, it's going to be repossessed anyway because it's on a low cost and downward mortgage and I couldn't afford to pay it off. The couple that were in there before us apparently were knocking each other about a bit, so although we were arguing, it wasn't violent. And then I was doing the healing, which maybe was raising a vibration for him. But anyway, I sat down and told him this, and then within a week, this guy turns up, want your house, you got to move out. So, a, f a lady in the village who had also been a client, she ran sewing groups. <laughs> well, unbeknown to me, one of her sewing class was a lady I'd done a treatment on about a year previous, and she's opened up a place in my old village called the Elephant Rooms, and I think she needed a healing, but she also was sussing me out to make me go and work there, yeah. <clears throat> which didn't happen, unfortunately. But anyway, she was at the sewing class and she happened to say that her new partner had a house for rent. And so my sewing lady told me, so I went round and saw them. But I said, I can't move in straight away because I can't afford a mortgage and a rent. And he said, that's fine. You want to do a bit of work on it. And then all of a sudden this has gone through and I had to go and say to him, look, can I move in? So I got all my kit out of my house and just stuck it in the new one on the ground floor. And then I disappeared to Manchester for a week doing healing. They were then taking me to France for a week, which was a whole new learning curve as well. Mm -hmm. And then I came back and I went and house sat for my daughter in Cumbria, at uh, Nice, sorry, in, in Cumbria. And then came back and sorted the house out. So you've gone from one thing to another. Just almost like everywhere you've gone, touching these people's lives with the healing. Yes. And you feel like deep down at your core, at your core. Yes. Because when we went to Spain, out uh, to France, to Provence, 
it was a group of um, masseurs and people, and they were all into aromatherapy and mm-hmm. things like that. And I thought, I don't want to pay this all this fortune to go to France uh, uh, just uh, sort of smelling yeah. stuff up my nose. I'm not really into it. Mm-hmm. But when I got there, as it turned out, I ended up doing a bit of teaching and coming to meet animal guides and things like that. There were other people there teaching different stuff as well. But one of their staff members was an Ecuadorian trained shaman. So I done a session on him one night and it was all about his dad and how his dad hadn't shown him that he loved him and he respected him and all that sort of thing. And then he done one the following night on me and it was all about my dad. Anyway, I went back the following year to see him and he said everything had changed mm-hmm. because of what we did. His dad turned around and said, you know, I love you, don't you? And I, you, you know, had the blue. Yeah, you can go and do whatever you want to do. I respect you, I, you know. And so he'd been that job and now he's running um, trips to Ecuador. So it's almost to feels like you. Oh, when you're kind of talking to spirit, you're able to uh, rewrite contracts with people. Oh, I don't know about that. I don't know about rewriting the contracts, but maybe we're he- helping them to realise the lesson they wanted to learn from the contract. Yeah, yeah. So he picked his dad, and his dad had treated him like that. His lesson was to overcome that and repair it with his dad, the same as I had to do with mine. So do you think you'd bring it to a conclusion for people then, that part of it? Does yeah, something just, change, it doesn't it, after you well, see people? When we do... Because I take you've experienced it, I take you back and you confront people or events and you relive them and release it. But I think in doing that, you kind of step back from the emotion that you've been caught up in, which has caused all your ailments or your stress and depression or where it might be, and you realise, ah, oh, I wanted to learn this from that. So you've seen it objectively. Yeah, and as soon as you say that or you learn that. It all goes away. I got it. Yeah. I'm not, yeah. They, they sometimes test yeah. you, and it will come back in a minor way, just to make sure. In my case, it came back in a major way, but yeah. You know, but once you realise the lesson, you don't react the same. So you give people with that awareness, you give them the realisation of the lesson that they can see objectively. Yes. That's really profound. If you say so. Well, I, 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 it is. And you're a great believer that the emotions kind of cause a lot of illness. Yes, yeah, definitely. I mean, I there was a client of mine in Leicester. She's been in pain for like 20 years now with fibro and stuff. And it was because she'd been abused as a child by a family member. <clears throat> and then she never said anything to anybody, but another family got a member, got abused by the same person. And then that guilt bleed from her up that she hadn't said nothing. However, a bit later on, a niece of hers, who was still related to this family member, had a child, and she went and told her. So the niece went and confronted this family member and said, you're never going to be alone with my child. Yeah. Anyway, we took a, I took her back, and about that guilt, and as soon as she released that guilt, she said, the following day, she ran up the wall at all night, she said, 75% of my pain has gone. Wow. Yeah, so there's still some stuff obviously to deal with because now we can do the physical side of it but your brain and what it does to your body is absolutely amazing but when you get ill it's not a punishment it's your body saying will you for Christ's sake take notice mm. and go and sort yourself out mm. and then once you sort yourself out it goes away I'm not saying there won't be another challenge coming that you agreed to but so you do bear medicine and, and do. six other energies. And that bear medicine, that hypnotherapist, she took me once to go and meet my dad. I obviously met him through shamanic journeys, or her, sorry. Um, she actually took me under hypnosis to go and meet her. And then the next minute I was stroking her and playing with her, and then I was inside her. Wow. And then I could feel the way she was moving, I could see the way she could smell the way she it was. You're very tuned Phenomenal. in, aren't you? you're very tuned into these kind well, of I don't realise I am. Yeah. Well, you are. Or I did yeah. then, anyway. Yeah. 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 You are. So it's. It's like a way of life for you now, yeah. isn't it? Well, yeah, but, it is. Okay. So you're the co author of several books. Yes. Well, I've written chapters, okay. three or four books now. 
Yeah. And you said you're going through another rebirth now, almost. I've been through loads of rebirths, and I think at the minute, yes, I've just gone through another one. And again, it's amazing how spirit works because I kept being told that I needed to connect with Merlin magic, and I thought, well, what the hell's Merlin magic? Uh -huh. Is it Druidry or something like that? So do you hear it in as a, as a audio, like a voice? No, no, it's, it, it, it's like mediums or something. And I'll so go and somebody will tell you something yeah. resonates with them. Yeah, and they'll say something. And if like I've got five medium friends and they're all telling me different stuff, I know, yeah, all right, fine, I'll just note it. And yeah, yeah, we'll see. But if I've got five friends and they're all telling me the same thing, maybe slightly different details, I go, boy, take notice. And so I've been told this Merlin magic, and I used to drive me some of it to get a bit of um, extra money. And I was coming back up again one from London once, and this truck beamed over, and there was this big white man with Merlin magic all over the side of it. And I went, yeah, yeah, all right, I'm getting it in. Mm. And it's been years. And then all of a sudden there was a guy in Nottingham doing a talk on Merlin magic. So I went, I couldn't not go, and I got talking to him, he's an ex-para, he's a wizard. Mm. And then I've just been up to Newark to go and see him. So it's almost like another learning curve. Yeah, yeah it's another thing because I've been saying I want to connect more with my yeah. ancient knowledge and my expansion and stuff like that. So mm. they've connected me now with this guy who channels, channels Merlin yeah. and he's repairing ley lines and things like that so whether this is my next yeah. path I don't know. Yeah. So you're very unique in your delivery for sure and, and I experienced that yesterday I, and I would encourage you know people to have a look on the page of Birmingham Realistic about care and you can book in and see him and, and experience it for yourself but it is a very very unique experience but I'll tell you Something lifted from me uh, when I had a session with him yesterday, and I'm going to go back in a couple of weeks and have some more. So I just want to kind of bring you up to date now, really, about where you are now. You're back with us, and you're kind yes. of know, which is great, really, and yeah. hopefully a good start again. Um, he's a good man, Kev, you know, and um, and I like your energy. You've got good energy, and I said that from the start. A couple of years ago, we met you. What do you want from the future? Well, it was weird, though, wasn't it? How Okay, folks, so years ago I went and done a show um, up north and there was a guy called Phil Carnell come in and the show was boring, there wasn't much going on, it was uh, in uh, Sandwich. Uh. And I was talking to him and then he says, he was obviously a bit of a medium, he says, Harry Edwards wants to connect with you. Uh, uh. And so he pulled down this imaginary computer screen and he's tapping on it, he's tapping me and he <laughs> says, right, it's done. And then I came in here for the first time to meet Stuart. And Stuart's trying to ask us, no, no, I want to, what's all these Ari Edwards pictures? What's all these Ari Edwards <laughs> books and stuff like that? <laughs> and it, that was like five years ago that that link was there. Like coming home, he wasn't it, really yes. in a way. Yeah. So what do you want for the future? For, for you and then for people to kind of experience? For me personally, I'm forever on a learning curve, and again, that's an Aquarian trait. Once you get a bit of knowledge, you want more, you want more, you want more. I want to continue my expansion, and I want my full remembrance of who I am and what I am and what I can do. Because my mum passed recently, and she used, I used to go down and say to mum, do you want to hear your mum? I said, hey, thank you, bloody Jesus, you are on your way. <laughs> You know what, woman? Yes, so I'll give her a healing. And then she's gone over, and now she's coming back, and she says, You don't know the art of what you can do. And I don't know the art of what I can do. Mm. So I'm waiting. Yeah. I had a reading with another lady in um, Tina Slade in Sussex, and she says, It's like I'm healing with two fingers, and I've got ten. Mm. But all this other stuff is coming in, mm. and then another shamanic lady who's helped me quite a bit, Stacey Keys. She said all the knowledge was waiting at my back, mm. but I had to call it in. I didn't realise it was even waiting there. Mm. So now she said that I'm calling it in, and I'm hoping that at some point, I know things are changing because I'm doing different things with my hands. If they move my hands about and do whatever, mm. but there's a lot more stuff. And apparently, I'm supposed to be speaking light language and using sound and stuff like that. And my voice, 
Yeah. It's almost like the shackles have kind of been taken off for you really now and yes. to experience this next part. But all said and done, with all the things that you've learned and the things that you're kind of imbibing, at the end of the day, the main thing with you that I felt is you've been a, your heart's good and a good man at heart. Well, his heart's know. good because I've had the operation. Uh, I knew you were going to say something, not in a physical <laughs> way, yeah. but your intention's good. Yeah. And that's the main thing. Yes. So, listen, folks, it's been really nice to speak to Kev, and hopefully you've enjoyed it. So, I'm going to put a little link afterwards with Kev's phone number if you want to give him a ring and see him. And any, either way, I hope you've enjoyed the chat. And uh, and we'll be back in a couple of weeks or so with um, with another interview. But thanks very much, Kev. Thanks no, thank much. you for inviting me, Stuart. It's been brilliant. Thank Cheers, you. mate. Thanks very much, thank folks. You. See you later.